In chapter 4, which begins on page 71 of your text, we're going to look at enzymes and metabolism. Um, and so you can see these would be the learning objectives for chapter 4, um, this first section. Uh, so defining metabolism, describing the structure and function of enzymes and how they're named, activation energy and how enzymes decrease that activation energy barrier. Uh, we're defining words like substrate and active site, explain how enzymes basically work with the induced fit model, enzyme specificity, and then finally at the end of this section we'll define denaturation uh, and describe the conditions that would cause an enzyme to do that. So in order to understand uh, enzymes and metabolism and their importance to us, what I wanted to start off with uh, is uh, an example from a TV show. You know, we've all seen um, either through commercial I actually watch the show called The Biggest Loser. And the concept of The Biggest Loser is it takes these people that are extremely obese, extremely overweight, um, and through a period, a period of several weeks, they go through drastic changes to their to their lifestyle, drastic changes to their to their diet, drastic changes to exercise, with the whole goal of losing the most weight. And so, um, several years ago, uh, on one of the the later seasons of Biggest Loser, uh, there was a contestant named Danny Cahill. Danny Cahill, um, when he started the show, he weighed 430 pounds, and, and over the period of that season, uh, he lost more weight than anyone had ever lost on the show and he ended the show at 191 pounds. Obviously he won that season and you can see this is what he looked like to start with uh, versus what it looked like at the end. But what's interesting is that if you followed him over the last several years since he was on the show he actually has gained back to 295 pounds currently. So he's actually gained 100 pounds back since leaving The Biggest Loser. And actually, if you follow a majority of the contestants that have been on the show, a majority of them have also gained a lot of weight back since having been on the show. And so the question is why? Why is it that these these people um, that lost so much weight and learned how to exercise and all these types of things, why is it that they've, they've gained weight? Now, some of them, it's just because when they went back home, they got back into their old habits, you know, as far as eating and not exercising and things like that. But the main thing to consider here is metabolism. Um, and, and doing a little bit of research on the show, uh, what's interesting is um, that several doctors and researchers that have done uh, a little bit of research here says that when the show began, the contestants that were hugely overweight, they had what we would consider to be normal metabolisms for their size. Now, if we look at metabolism, we know metabolism basically by definition is it's, it's all the chemical reactions that are occurring in your body. And, and so the amount of fat in individual stores depends partly on how quickly or how slowly these chemical reactions occur. And, and so what we know about the contestants of The Biggest Loser is that when they started the show, even though they were extremely overweight, they had normal metabolisms for their size. Um, and so what happened is by the end of the show, because of how drast the drastic measures that they, they experienced on the show between diet and exercise, their metabolisms had slowed down so much that their bodies were not even able to burn enough calories to maintain their thinner, thinner size. So when they went back home, because their metabolism and those chemical reactions had slowed so much, they're not able to burn enough calories and so they've started adding back on the weight. So metabolism is actually a product of two processes, anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is this process of building materials up where catabolism is breaking these things down. And so in order to understand a little bit about body weight and a little bit about these chemical reactions, what we first need to discuss are enzymes because chemical reactions are very dependent upon the activity of enzymes. So let's talk first about enzyme structure um, and then we'll kind of move into their function. So this is on page 72 in your text. So enzymes by structure are proteins, they're protein molecules, and their job is to catalyze or to speed up the rate of reaction. So their job is to cause these reactions to occur at a faster pace. Um, and so enzymes can be used uh, to either break down substances or to build them up. So enzymes can be used in both parts of metabolism. Now, one of the things that we know about enzymes is that enzymes are named for the reaction that they speed up. And so what actually happens is you take the name of the substance they're speeding up and you change the ending to ASE. So for example, um, if we're talking about the sugar sucrose, the enzyme that breaks it down is sucrase. So just changing the end name to it. Now some other things that we know about enzymes um, is, is we just said that 
they're going to speed up a reaction. So the question is, how do they do that? Well, in order to understand that, first we have to understand something called activation energy. So by definition, activation energy is the energy that's required to start a metabolic reaction. See, what we know, think about, for example, boiling water. If you put water in a pot and you put it on the stove, we know that it does not boil automatically. There's a certain amount of energy that has to be reached in order to cause that water to boil. That's called the activation energy. Now, what's good about this level of energy is that it acts as a barrier to prevent chemical reactions from occurring when you don't need the products. In other words, because there is this barrier, chemical reactions don't just always happen. We have to get up to this level in order to trigger them to start. So this acts as a barrier to actually uh, prevent these reactions from occurring when we don't need them to. Um, and so what actually happens with enzymes is they take this level of energy that must be reached to start a reaction and they decrease that amount of energy. By decreasing it, it allows us to reach that level faster, which speeds up the reaction. You know, so, for example, if you look at this picture that's on the bottom of 72, if you look at uh, image A, you'll notice, okay, here would be representing a regular amount of energy that bikes, you know, by this hill. And so, we're just looking at the regular amount. Bikes have to get all the way up to the top of this hill, then to come back down. But what enzymes do is they take that level and they lower it. By lowering it, notice how many more bikes are able to cross to the other side and, and probably how much quicker they are able to do that as well. Now, a couple of vocabulary terms that we associate with enzymes. Uh, first off, the term substrate. Substrate is the chemical that's being metabolized by the enzyme. In other words, the substrate is the substance that the enzyme is reacting with or is speeding up. Another term that we know is that every enzyme has on it what's called an active site. So this is, this is the region of the enzyme where the substrate or the substance actually binds to. So if you look at this image that's on page 73 or over to the side here, you'll notice this big green uh, structure uh, is the enzyme sucrase. And at the very top, here's the active site that the substrate sucrose binds to. And so you'll notice when these two react, there's a bond that forms. Uh, when the substrate binds to the active site, the enzyme will change shape so that it can completely uh, envelop the substrate. This is known as the induced fit model. So it has the ability to change the shape of that active site so that they bind perfectly. Shape is very, very important here. If they don't bind and it doesn't completely uh, envelop the substrate, you won't see the reaction that you, that you need. So again, induced fit model, the enzyme active site changes shape so that they'll bind perfectly. This causes them to fit more snugly uh, it, and then it stresses the bonds of the substrate. Um, and so uh, the importance here is like in this case with sucrose, the change in shape causes the substrate to split and to release what it's made of. So sucrose splits into glucose and fructose uh, and these two things are released so that your, your cells can use them. Uh, what's interesting about the induced fit model is that once it occurs uh, and the product that you need is produced, then the enzyme returns to its original shape and it's ready to do its job again. So the enzyme is not used up in a reaction, it, it's one that can continually be, be reused. Now an important thing to note about enzymes is something called enzyme specificity. Uh, basically that word specific. So enzymes are very specific to a substrate. They're particular, so they only react with certain things. Uh, so very, very important to note that enzymes are particular. They're picky. Uh, each en enzyme is composed of certain sequences of amino acids, because remember we said again enzymes are proteins and structures, so they're made of amino acids. And enzymes are coded for by genes. So if we come back to this concept of weight, the amount of body fat a person stores is affected by a lot of factors, some of which we can control, like our eating habits and the amount of exercise we get. But if we're saying that enzymes speed up these reactions and enzymes are coded for by our genes, the things that we inherit, then the amount of body fat that we actually store, to some extent, is uncontrollable because it's something that we inherit. So something interesting to think about when we're talking about weight uh, and metabolism. Now, uh, one other important thing to know about enzymes is that enzymes not only are specific to certain substrates, but enzymes also only work under certain conditions. So we have a vocabulary term here called denaturation. Now, by definition, it's the process of an, of an enzyme losing its shape. Now, we just discussed the fact that shape is important. 
and that enzymes have that ability to change the shape of their active site so they'll fit more snug with the substrate actually causing the reaction. So if an enzyme loses its shape, it loses its function as well. So the question is, what kind of conditions would cause an enzyme to be denatured or to lose its shape? And there's really two important conditions. One is improper temperature. Two is improper pH. Let's talk about temperature for a, section, for a second. Now, we know that increased temperature can increase enzyme activity. So that's what it tells us here is that enzyme activity increases with temperature because it causes more collisions between enzyme and substrate, which causes a quicker reaction. However, if the temperatures get too hot, it can destroy the shape of the enzyme or destroy the enzyme altogether, and then, of course, it can't do its job. The other thing that we know about enzymes is that they are not only substrate specific, but they are pH specific. So there's certain pHs they have to be at. And if they're at the wrong pH, it can alter the side chains, alter the shape of the enzyme, and again, therefore, not allowing it to do its job. So kind of putting all this together that we know about enzymes, we just said the speed and efficiency of enzymes leads to increase or decrease in the rate at which you break down food because we know that enzymes can either speed up metabolism or they can slow materials, slow reactions down. And then again we know in effect slow or fast metabolism refers to the speed again at which these chemical reactions happen. So they affect how quickly or how slowly we're breaking down food. So one of the things that it addresses in the chapter is something known as metabolic rate. So we know metabolic rate is a measure of how we use energy and this rate changes according to our activity level. So we know the rate of our metabolism can be sped up or slowed down by our exercise habits, um, by being male or female, and it talks about the fact that males require more energy per day because of testosterone, also because of muscle mass, and so we would expect to see a different metabolic rate there. But again, we also establish the fact that because enzymes are coded for by genes, that our metabolic rate can also be affected by our genetics. So several things to consider when we're talking about enzymes. Now, this is the end of this section, uh, but continuing in Chapter 4, uh, in the next part, we're going to look at cellular respiration, which also plays a role in dealing with these metabolic reactions.